Hey, good afternoon to you. Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com, here with your hurricane outlook and discussion for Wednesday, July 24th, 2019. I hope your Wednesday is going nice and well, fine and dandy. If you live east of the Mississippi uh, and other places where the front came through, your weather is a lot more comfortable today. Uh, it did come with a bunch of interesting side effects. A tornado up in Cape Cod, did you see about that? I tweeted some of the video, I retweeted uh, some of the video that was captured there near Chatham. Wow, I've been up there for a couple of blizzards and, you know, 60, 70 mile per hour wind across the Atlantic. But that, uh, that video that I retweeted yesterday, that was something else. All right, well, let's get on with it. Uh, the front has cleared the coast down here and uh, really that'll clear out any chance of development anytime soon. And in fact, most of the globe is tropical cyclone free, nothing in the Western Pacific, uh, certainly nothing in the Atlantic Basin. We just have this leftover depression here that was once tropical storm Delilah, but that's about it. Uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, the little X down here, 90% chance that nothing will develop. <laughs> that's the way I like to look at it. And that's fine because, uh, you know, as much as I relish the opportunity to study the impacts of tropical cyclones when they do hit land and there's nothing wrong with enjoying your work it doesn't mean that I relish people's lives being upended that's that's not what I'm saying but when something does hit you bet I want to be there and throw as much as much technology at it as I can my team and I and that being said we don't want to have anything down here festering because we need to be over here a week from today in Elk City, Oklahoma, to test our weather balloon, Herbie, Hurricane Research Balloon, next week. Uh, it's going to be real hot. I did see that. It's nice in Oklahoma City and points west today, out on old Route 66 there in Elk City. But boy, next week when we do the launch, the test launch, it looks like the old weather balloon and the payload will go right up into the eastern side of an upper level anticyclone. Uh, deep layer ridge, sinking air all across this area, big heat dome, and uh, extending into the desert southwest. And yeah, it's going to be toasty. So I don't think this will do much. The Hurricane Center has reduced the odds down to about 10% for development, so we don't have to worry about that too much. Uh, if we look at the satellite picture here, you get a couple of vantage points. First, the Gulf of Mexico over on this side, the stalled frontal boundary. And we'll look at this in more detail in a moment. First, Check out Delilah. It has uh, sort of found its way into cooler water, a more stable air mass up in here as a result of that cooler water, and it is just kind of slowly starving to death. It's kind of sad, isn't it? It's a morbid way to go. Imagine just not being able to eat or drink, okay, for days at a time, and eventually you just wither away, and that's what happens with these systems. We, as human beings, part of the animal species and other animals out there we have to eat and drink and that provides us our energy obviously plants do it through energy from the sun through photosynthesis and even though this is not a living thing per se it is a process in the atmosphere that resembles the living thing in terms of the fact that it needs energy a food supply and as they move over that cooler water and Delilah is not moving fast at all uh, they they kind of die away over time and you can see oops let me go back I thought I had a close-up of it that's fine uh, but you get the point you know it's moved into this cooler water and even as it tries to pull in air from farther to the south it's not enough it's not enough to save it it's like you being stuck way out in the desert somewhere and you have a satellite phone and you only have hours to live and you order some uber eats they're not going to get to you in time, sorry. So Delilah suffering uh, a slow and painful death in the Pacific. All right, there's my attempt at some literary prose today. Uh, looking at the front, wow, that's kind of neat looking, wouldn't you say? Look at that frontal boundary sagging south with this large storm system, a lot of vorticity, energy in the atmosphere, cooler air instability, as indicated. You can really see that for those of you that know meteorology. Uh, if you're in a ship out here and you looked up, that sky would be amazing, just put it that way. 
Um, you can also see right there the outline of actual dust in the atmosphere being ejected off of Africa into the Atlantic. Strong mid-level winds and low-level winds coming across, kicking up that dust at the surface, blows it up into the atmosphere a few thousand feet. It's not way up in the upper levels, and that's why the upper level winds can still come across this way. They're not right now, I'm just saying. You can have upper level winds way up at 30, 40,000 feet, and that's not where the dust is typically. The dust is typically, oh, I don't know, six, seven, eight, nine thousand feet, maybe 10,000 feet, something like that. Uh, and it's dry, too. This air in here is warm overall and dry. And if you know basic meteorology, to have instability, you need cold air over warm air so that the warm, unstable air, which re is represented here, I'm trying to just draw here, is rising into this larger area of cold air. It's called a parcel, an air parcel. It has to rise. If it doesn't rise, you don't get convection. And if you don't get convection, you cannot have a tropical cyclone. It's that simple. All right, so there's the frontal boundary, a focusing mechanism for air to come together, a convergent zone, vorticity or energy along this. We don't even need to look at the vorticity chart. You just know it's there. And yeah, sometimes you get these waves of low pressure that are develop along these. In the wintertime, they can spawn little coastal storms and bring snow to parts of the southeast. In the summer and fall, when you drape these cold fronts across these warm waters, you oftentimes, well not too often, uh, you get a wave to develop, a wave of low pressure, a little kink in the front, and if conditions are favorable, you can get a hurricane out of it. I just don't think that's going to happen this time. At least, overall, the models are not too bullish. But, boy, look, talking about dry air, look at that dry air mass, and you can definitely see it outlined in here. Wow, if this was January, it'd probably be in the you know 30s for highs in the Piedmont, probably single digits over the Midwest. I don't know, I'm just speculating. In the summer, <laughs> it's not as that cold, thank goodness, but it definitely has cooled off and the dew points have come down. Uh, but you know, things will change. This, this energy, the trough that carved this out will lift out. The Bermuda High will build back in and pump that uh, juicy air right back into parts of the southeast uh, and make us all hot and humid once again. All right, um, moving along, I want to show you this as it relates to a tweet that I'm going to show at the end here from Tyler Stanfield at OU. Uh, this is the CDAS uh, temperature profile here from tropicaltidbits.com showing the Nino 3.4 area. I, come on, Mark. It's not the Nino. That's this over. I guess I didn't pull it up. I just have to slow down sometimes. This is the MDR, not the Nino 3.4, the main development region. And what I want to point out, I'm going to use green here. Um, today's value is at 0.18 above the long-term average. The overall trend since early July uh, late June, early July, overall, clearly see, I'm just drawing this in here, has been up. Can't argue that. Look, I'll take my telestration away. We'll do it in this sort of uh, opaque yellow. Overall, the trend line has been up. You can see that as clearly as I can. Meanwhile, in the Pacific, I don't have the chart pulled up, but that's fine. Again, as I talked about this some yesterday, look at what's happening here. Now, this is a climato uh, the climatological background is 1981 through 2010. This will switch next year and it'll end with 2020. Uh, 1991 through 2020, I believe, something like that. That 30 year data set to where you derive your averages from, right? Does that make sense? You have to have some kind of a background state. The average of what? And in this case, the climatological background for the CDAS data is 1981 through 2010. And you can see down there in the area that I've outlined in the green, these instability waves as the uh, Pacific is bringing up colder water from the subsurface. And as it's represented here on the scale from uh, Mr. Cowan, Levi Cowan at Tropical Tidbits, that represents cold anomalies. 
and it's starting to spread westward and getting into and closer to that Nino 3.4 area, which is roughly out in here. Remember, the ENSO, the El Nino Southern Oscillation phenomenon, is divided into these regions. I should have pulled it up to show you. It's kind of like a Venn diagram, not really, but kind of. It's just a, it's a way to look at the different areas because every El Nino is not the same. And what we have here is this warming area, or warm area relative to average, in the central to western Pacific, while the eastern Pacific is definitely colder than the long-term average. We call this uh, a Madoki type El Nino, um, and that's a Japanese term that I think it means the same but different or something like that. So it's an El Nino phenomenon, but it's a different kind of El Nino phenomenon. And I'm going to talk to Ben Knoll down in Auckland, New Zealand about that uh, on Saturday evening as part of a series that I'm putting together called Hurricane U, meaning Hurricane University. And I think you guys are going to really like that. We're going to publish that for our Patreon supporters first, and then on YouTube, out in the wild, as they say, after that. And we'll get into more of what some of these things mean. But this is important because... It takes time, but generally when you knock these sea surface temperatures down, you eventually start to limit the rising motion in the Pacific, and as you can see, this very warm Atlantic. Not quite the perfect AMO signature if this was a little bit more south and east from where it is now. I'll try to draw that in to help define that. Um, it would be a more positive AMO look, or Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation look. Fancy way of saying the Atlantic's warmer than it should be over multiple decades. Basically, normally this would be a positive sign for hurricane development and a negative sign for Eastern Pacific development overall. Um, but there's other factors. Warm water alone does not create hurricanes. You have to have the moisture in the atmosphere, the light winds. You can't have winds screaming across, cetera, the tops off of these systems etc and so forth and so on but the, what I'm getting at it's changing and let me get rid of me I want to feature Mr. Stanfield here from OU look at what he's talking about the climate models are once again playing catch up with the cooling equatorial Pacific and I just showed you that with the CFS that's the climate forecast system ensemble mean that's the average of the mean or sorry the average of the ensemble an ensemble is a bunch of models, more or less, right? Now decidingly favoring the dissipation of El Nino and the development of cool neutral, and I'm going to highlight this one here, underlined it in red, or La Nina conditions by fall 2019 and persisting into 2020. Now you say, well, Mark, that doesn't show that. Well, that's because this is a GIF animation that he put together, and when I click on it, it goes into motion. That's February 12th, April 12th, May 12th, June 12th, July 12th, and today. Whoa! Wow, let's see if it'll play again. Sometimes it doesn't. That's okay. Look at where we are uh, headed. This is where we are now, and this is what the ensemble mean is forecasting now, this should definitely get the attention of Dr. Klotzbach at Colorado State. Uh, that's impressive. Okay, and the blues are the most recent model runs, the most recent members. You can kind of see them in there. But the ensemble mean, that's, a, that's, a, that's getting it there. That's getting into La Nina territory as we get into next year, which could have implications on next year's hurricane season. But you know what? That's a long way away. And we haven't even gotten through this one. But the changes are there. Now we have to see. Remember. See if I can. No, I can't draw on my clock. It's July 24th. That's when this updated. You can, oh, it's like a newspaper. Hold up a newspaper to prove what day it is. It's July 24th. It's not August 24th. We still have time for this to continue to progress. Snake its way westward a little more. Chisel away at this overall warm pool that's still here and begin to change the pattern. Now, I've seen Ben Knoll talking about this, that we do have this uh, rising motion going on in the Pacific generally and a sinking motion going on in the Atlantic that maybe that'll switch and the models might start catching up with that. 
Does that make sense? If they're catching up with the cooling, maybe there's also a lag that they eventually catch up with the change to cooler and start showing because the Atlantic is overall warmer, especially up here in the North Atlantic. Dang. Uh, I hope you don't have investments in icebergs up there. Hey, that was kind of funny. Come on. Um, that we start to see a change in the model guidance from the Euro weeklies, the JMA, and others, that the Atlantic becomes more favorable latter part of August through September and through October. I'm starting to see if a possible... I mean, you think about it. Bring me back up. Maybe. Where am I? There I am. Think about 2016, Matthew, October. 2017, Nate, October. And yeah, Nate was... You know, close. It tried to make a run at being a pretty intense hurricane. It just ran out of time. And then, of course, last year, Michael, absolutely a Category 5 hurricane on October 10th. Uh, that's pretty significant. So I'm wondering if the seasons are shifting. And I know I'm looking at only three seasons here, 16, 17, 18. And I mean, in the geologic scale, that's nothing. But are we, even temporarily, a small shift uh, well, let's see, it'd be a rather large. What am I trying to say? In the temporal sense, time, right? Maybe we are seeing a shift uh, over a few years, and it could change back in a few years. I'm not saying a permanent shift, but it, it, it does have my attention that Matthew was October, Nate was October, um, and of course, last year, Matthew or Michael also October that maybe the season is going to peak a little later than September 10th for the next few years. Maybe I'm full of it. I don't know. It's just observations, and it's, you start to kind of wonder. Again, it's like putting together clues to solving a crime or a mystery, and in this case, the mysteries of the atmosphere. And all of these things go into that. And I'll certainly ask Ben Knoll about that Saturday night during my interview is there a lag going on, number one, possibly? The climate models are, I don't know, I'm rehashing what I just said, but just kind of thinking about it again, and it'll remind me what to ask Ben. Are the models playing catch up with the ENSO forecast? Also, those same models may be going to catch up with the upward motion versus sinking motion forecasts, plural, going forward. And then... Are we maybe shifting the hurricane season and our seasons as a whole, possibly due to climate change and global warming, whatever you want to call it? I don't know. Something that he can help opine about in a very sensible way without getting too over the top, you know, that the sky is falling because uh, whatever. That's not what we do here. But it's very interesting. I think you would agree with that. All right? And I think we could all agree that is enough for me for today. It's nice and quiet out there, so let's keep it as brief as possible. But it is sometimes interesting. I don't want to say fun, because sometimes the weather is not fun. But it is interesting to go looking and seeing if we are, are recognizing any patterns, any shifts, anything we can seek our teeth into that will help us unravel some of these mysteries. All right? That's it from me for today. Thanks, as always, for tuning in from your device, whatever you're watching and listening to me from. I really appreciate it. It all adds up. It's great to have you on the other side. I am Mark Sutteth, HurricaneTrack.com. I'll be back with more for you tomorrow.